Welcome to Broadway Christian Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us and we'd love to connect with you. A great way to do that is by filling out the Connect card on the watch page of our website. Just head to broadwaycc.org slash watch to sign up for our communications, update your information, or to let us know how we can pray with you and for you this week. Another way is by checking out our special Connect event on January 10th and 17th, where you'll be able to learn about all of our small groups and ways that you can serve. This event is happening during our services both here in the building and online, so be on the lookout for more info in your email. Today, we're starting a new message series called Waypoint, and we'll learn that wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. Let's pray, and then we'll worship together. God, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to to worship you and have a relationship with you. We pray that as we sing, as we take communion, as we we open your word, uh, God, that you would encourage us today and challenge us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. a sea of voices we are an ocean of your praise gathered under one name we are a tide that's rising and we cannot be contained gathered under one name oh for a thousand tongues to sing the glory Sorrow swept away this song together, that in the midst of anything going on, he is still king. We raise a hallelujah to him this morning. Here we go. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than Hallelujah, my weapon is a melody. 
melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me Sing with Kate We take communion and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. We take a piece of bread and cup of juice to remember his broken body and shed blood. If you have something at home that you can use for communion, go ahead and get those things ready now. Uh, but if you don't have anything you can use, that's okay. Uh, let's all take some time now to reflect on what Jesus has done for us. Another way we worship is by giving. This is one way that we can come together and further our mission of helping people find hope in Christ and home in his church. If you'd like to give today, you can head to our website or text a dollar amount to 84321. Let's pray and then we'll hear a message from Ian. God, thank you. Uh, thank you again for the privilege that we have to worship you. 
uh, the technology that we can use to still uh, be together in some fashion and, and worship together. Um, God, I pray that as we open your word now, that you'd speak to us today and that uh, you'd help us to know what next steps uh, we need to take to be closer to you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everybody. Grab a Bible, open it up to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1. The picture on your screen is Bob Fisher. Bob Fisher is the best free throw shooter in the world. Now, he is a 62-year-old soil conservation technician who lives in Kansas. He played basketball as a kid and then played recreationally with his friends up into his early 40s. But in, in his early 50s, he started intentionally practicing free throws. He can now make hundreds in a row without missing. He holds 25 Guinness World Records, including most free throws made in a minute, which is 50, by the way, in 60 seconds. So the, the question begs to be asked, how is it then that some average blue-collar worker in Kansas is so much better at shooting free throws than elite professional athletes. I mean, right now, the NBA average of free throws is they make 73% of them. Uh, they're missing a whole lot. So how is it that he's so much better? Well, apparently, good free throw shooters are not born. They are made. His success shows that it's not inborn talent, it's not natural athleticism that makes all the difference. It's hard work. Now, that same truth can be applied to our faith. Godly people are not born. They are made. Now, around here, we use a phrase that I think helpfully sums up God's desire for us to grow spiritually. Wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. Wherever you are in your faith, wherever you are in your marriage, wherever you are in your knowledge of the Bible, wherever you are in your prayer life, wherever you are in the closeness with which you walk with the Lord, God doesn't want you there. So we're beginning this new series of messages today called Waypoint that's going to emphasize spiritual growth and how to do that through the Bible. Now, when you open up the GPS app on your phone or in your car, and you type in your desired destination into it, it drops down this little arrow that, that points to where you are and where you want to go. That arrow is called the waypoint. And today, we're going to start by talking about where you are. Wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. He wants you to grow. So let's take the next few minutes and let's talk about how to do that. And to talk about that, we're going to go to the premier text in the New Testament that talks about growing spiritually. 2 Peter chapter 1, let's start in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall." For in this way, there will be richly provided for you 
an inheritance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. He wants us walking closer with him. He wants us growing spiritually. You know, for decades, Billy Graham, the great evangelist, would end his sermons at his crusades by having the crowd sing the hymn, Just As I Am, for the invitation time. And that hymn sent a powerful message to that crowd. You can come to Jesus just as you are. But here's the truth that the song leaves out. You can come to Jesus just as you are, but he never leaves you that way. He always changes you. Wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. So how do we do that? How do we then grow spiritually? Well, in the text we just read, Peter lays out for us some steps to take. If we're going to grow spiritually, here's how we do it. Step number one, encounter the reasons for growth. Encounter the reasons for growth. Notice how he began, because I think this is the, the critical foundation that we build upon when we talk about spiritual growth. Go back to verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he's granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now, Peter gives us a couple of reasons for spiritual growth. If we're going to encounter the reasons for growth, here they are. Reason number one is God's powerful provision. Look at verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all the things that pertain to life and godliness. Meaning this. God has already done the foundational work of your spiritual growth. Friends, we are without excuse. God has provided everything that we need, everything for life, to honor him, to follow him, to grow closer to him. He's provided everything for godliness, everything that we need to look like him, to live like him. He has provided all of it. My kids can tell you that one of my favorite days of the year is school supply shopping day. I, I, I love it. I, I'm a nerd. I like school. Therefore, I like school supplies. Buying them engages this part of the brain that says it's time to begin another year of learning. So you get a new backpack and you get all the supplies that you need for a successful school year. So you, you throw in all the, the pens and the pencils and the notebooks and the textbooks. And, and when you go to school on that first day, you have everything that you need. All of the tools have been provided for you. That's what Peter is telling us. God gave you the backpack. God has given you all the tools that you need. So God's powerful provision is one of the reasons for growth. Second, God's precious promises. Go to verse 4. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So not only has God's power provided for us everything that we need, God's promises have enabled us to grow. Notice that God's promises are precious. They are infinitely valuable. He says God's promises are also very great, Peter says. That phrase, very great, is the Greek word mega. God's promises are mega promises. They're huge. They're life-changing. They're overwhelming. And these mega promises are quite potent. They enable us, Peter says, to become partakers of the divine nature. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's not like some Eastern mysticism that says that you know, all humans have the spark of the divine within them and, and with it, you know, enough meditation, we can become divine. That's nonsense. That's not what the Bible is saying. All this is saying is God's promises enable you to become more like him to participate in the divine nature of how God is, that we can indeed grow in our faith. 
we can begin to look more and more like Jesus. It is actually possible. So friend, you are not stuck. You are not hopelessly bound up in your sin. His promises free you from that. Well, promises like what? That God loves us? That Jesus gave his life for us? That that he's given us his Holy Spirit? That the work of salvation that he began in you when you became a Christian, he's going to bring to a place of completion? God has not left you alone to figure this thing out on your own. He helps us. He empowers us. Now, what has Peter just done in those opening verses? Given us these reasons for growth. He has built the theological and the practical foundation for spiritual growth. God has done everything that we could ever need him to do. He has saved us. He's granted us the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given us all the tools that we need to grow. He's rescued us, Peter said, from the corruption of the world. He's made it possible for us to join him in his holiness. He's provided everything that we need. You've been given a full backpack. Well, now what? Well, step number two, we engage the requirement of growth. It begins by encountering the reasons for growth. Now we engage the requirement of growth. Go to verse five. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. So you have the full backpack on the the first day of school. Well, does that mean you're going to get a 4.0? Not at all. I mean, you actually need to do something with what you've been given. You got to put it to work. You have to combine the pens and the paper and write some stuff. You need to produce some, some papers. You have to actually read that textbook and apply that knowledge. Carrying a backpack around doesn't equal straight A's. Doing the hard work does. Friends, God does the saving. God does the empowering. God does the providing. But you have to actually do the work. God doesn't read your Bible for you. God doesn't say your prayers for you. God is not generous with your money for you. God doesn't serve your church in your place because you're not doing it. You do those things. You take responsibility in those steps of spiritual growth. Yet, God is there the whole time at work behind the scenes. Notice what Philippians chapter 2 says, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your salvation, not work for your salvation. That's by grace. Work out your salvation, exercise it, put it into practice. Why? Because God is working in you to will and to work. So not just to do the work, but to want to do the work. God's the one who's doing all that. So you work because God is already at work in you. This is why we don't get to take credit. We don't get to take credit for our salvation. That's a work of God. Nor do we get to take credit for our sanctification, for our growing in personal holiness, because God is the one ultimately taking us from where we are to where he wants us to be. That's what Peter is telling us. He has provided all of this Now you get to work. Now, notice how he began in verse 5. For this very reason. So because everything that we talked about in verse 3 and verse 4 of God's powerful provision and his precious promises, because all of that is true, we make every effort. So we do a couple of things. First of all, we strive. The phrase that he uses, make every effort, is a powerful phrase. In fact, it's used only here in the entire New Testament. It's a phrase that that means that we bring to bear 
every eagerness, all diligence, all fervor. So because God has done his saving work for us, we then respond to that by bringing every diligence. We bring all eagerness to bear on our spiritual growth. This is a whole life endeavor. All of us comes to bear on this goal of spiritual growth. And without this wholesale effort, we're in trouble. This is how D.A. Carson put it. He said, people do not drift toward holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and call it freedom. We drive toward superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. That's a scary truth that we don't naturally drift towards holiness. We don't naturally grow spiritually. We drift towards bad and evil things, so we strive toward holiness. So we strive, second, we supplement. Make every effort to supplement. Now, that word is a great one in the original language. It, it comes into the English language as our word choreography. So the image is of a director putting together a play. They take the music and the dancing and the lights and the speaking parts and the stage design, and they, they put it all together to be this brilliantly choreographed show. That's what we do with our faith. God has given us the pieces. We put it together. So he says, supplement your faith. God's given you faith. Supplement it with virtue. Now, he's already used this word virtue up in verse 3. He spoke of God, saying that God has called us to his own glory and excellence. Well, that word for excellence is the, the same word he uses here for virtue. It refers to moral goodness, that God is excellent because he is morally good. Well, now we've been called to that very thing. One author called this energetic moral excellence. It is the pursuit of everything that is good and right as defined by God. It's not just that we avoid that which is bad and evil. We actively pursue the things that are good and right that God would want us to have. So we supplement our faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge. Well, that's a pretty simple one to get. You need to know more than you do. I need to know more than I do. No matter where we are, God doesn't want us there. He wants us to grow in our knowledge of him. Add to, your, to knowledge self-control, a word that literally translates have power over yourself. You are not at the, the whim and power of your sin and your desires. You, you have the gift of self-control. Supplement self-control with steadfastness, a word that means to remain under to keep going, to bear whatever burden in the name of not giving up. Supplement steadfastness with godliness. Again, it's the same word back from verse 3 that God has provided everything we need for life and godliness. Supplement godliness with brotherly affection, a friendly demeanor, the ability to get along with others. <laughs> Friends, in our world, uh, this is a much to be desired character trait, the ability to get along and have a friendly demeanor. And then supplement brotherly affection with love. It's the crown jewel of the list. That everything moves forward and culminates at agape, self-sacrificial love for the people around you. Now, a list like that of all these character traits are, are called virtue lists. There are several of them in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul likes to use them in a number of his letters. They're there to give us a snapshot of the characteristics of a Christian life. This is what a Christian looks like. So you've been given the gift of faith. Now supplement it. Add to it all of these characteristics. 
Well, where do you find those? Where do you find those character qualities to add? They're in the backpack. He's already given them to you. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. We simply have to put them in place and choreograph them together. So the image maybe is kind of like buying a, a model car kit or, or buying a jigsaw puzzle. All of the pieces are there. We just have to assemble it all, put it all together. So we take what the Lord has given and we begin to put these into place over and over and over again and supplement our faith with all of these virtues. Step number three, we enjoy the results of growth. So we began by saying we encounter the reasons for growth, then we engage the requirement for growth, and it ends with enjoying the results of growth. Go to verse eight. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you put these pieces together and your life is defined by them and you have them increasing in your life, wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. You continue to grow. There are multiple benefits, such glorious results of that. He lists four of them. Benefit number one is competence. Competence. Go to verse 8. They keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know a single Christian who says that the goal for their faith is that they would be ineffective and unfruitful. I mean, Christians don't say, you know what, I, I, I want to do nothing at all for Jesus, and I, I want my life to count diddly squat for the kingdom. Christians don't say such things. Taking what the Lord has given us and putting those pieces together allows us in our faith to be effective, to be fruitful. So competence, the, the second benefit is clarity. Go to verse 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So if you, if you don't do this, if you neglect this wholesale commitment to spiritual growth, you will end up so focused, nearsighted, on what is right in front of you. Things like money and success and career and politics. You will be so nearsighted, you will be blind to the things that matter. So much so that you will forget. The word means ignored. You'll forget that you've been forgiven. The, the fact and the reality of your salvation will make no practical difference in your life whatsoever. I mean, how, how sad it is that there are so many self-confessed Christians who cross the line into faith and then never take another step forward. This is their ultimate destination. They're nearsighted and blind, and the great work of salvation that Jesus has accomplished for them makes no difference at all in their life. But if you take these steps of growth, you get clarity. You're not nearsighted. You're, you're not blind. You can see what life is really about. Third benefit is confirmation. Look at verse 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. So living like this, putting these pieces together, confirms your calling and your election. It breeds the assurance of your salvation. So there's no more doubting of whether you're saved or not. There's no more doubting if God is at work in your life or not, because he obviously is, because he's, he's working in your life right now. You can, you can see him transforming your life before your very eyes. And Peter says, if you do that, you'll never fall. Now, he doesn't mean that if you pursue spiritual growth, you'll never sin again. That, that's not the case at all. The picture he's given us is a, of a line of soldiers that are marching in unified formation. 
You're moving forward to your destination of Christ-likeness. And if you live like this, you won't fall out of line and miss that journey. Last benefit is confidence. Go to verse 11. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't that what you're ultimately about? I mean, we're, we're striving, we're yearning for heaven. Isn't, isn't that what we're wanting? Now, it's not that your hard work of spiritual growth is what gets you into heaven. Now, again, that's nonsense. It's that we are confidently walking forward toward Jesus Christ. We've been doing that all of our lives, showing that that's what we want to do for all of eternity. We want to be with him. So now we start living as closely to him as we possibly can. What an incredible passage of scripture. I, I love 2 Peter chapter 1. I mean, no wonder it's the premier text on spiritual growth. Wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. So you encounter the reasons for growth, his powerful provision, his precious promises. You engage the requirement for growth. You strive, you supplement, and then you enjoy the results of growth. You experience competence and clarity and confirmation and confidence. Isn't that what we're after? Isn't that the joy that you want in your life? Isn't that the goal of your faith? Well, friends, there's only one way to get all of this. And that is to start taking the steps of spiritual growth. We stand at the threshold of a new year. Make this year your year. A year from now, we're going to be standing at the same spot again with another calendar page having turned and we'll be another new year. Don't stand at this point next year in the same place of regret because yet another year has gone by that you did not grow like you wanted to grow. You can. God has done everything he could possibly do, everything that we needed him to do. He's given you everything you need. Now it's time to get to work. In 2003, the British Olympic cycling team was in a hopeless place. They had only won one gold medal since 1908. That is pitiful. But in 2003, they made a monumental change. They hired a new coach named Dave Brailsford. Brailsford set out to systematically transform the team. And he did it by making what he called 1% changes, little changes here and there. So he helped redesign the seats on the bikes. He, he bought them a bit more aerodynamic suits for the riders to wear. They rubbed alcohol on the tires so that the rubber had better grip with the pavement. 1% here, 1% there. But over time, that added up. So five short years later in 2008 at the, the Olympics in Beijing, the Olympic British cycling team won 60% of the available gold medals that year. Four years later in 2012 in London, the British team set nine new Olympic records and they set seven new world records monumental transformation in a very short amount of time, and they did it by making 1% changes. So when it comes to your faith, when it comes to your spiritual growth, what 1% changes can you make? In, in regards to how you engage your Bible, your prayer life, involvement in church, what's the 1% change you can make? No one is asking you to become the fourth member of the Trinity by tomorrow. That's just not the case. It's one step after another. 1% here, 1% there. Wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. And he's given you everything that you need to get from where you are to where he wants you to go. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are overwhelmed with gratitude that you've been so good to us. Not only have you saved us, not only has the work of Jesus at the cross forgiven our sins, you've then given us this full backpack. You've given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. 
and you've called us to grow, to take the, the gift of faith that you've given to us and to supplement it with all of these other virtues, to continually grow spiritually. We're at a place in a new year where a lot of people are, are thinking about spiritual growth um, in new ways. God, would you fuel that in us in ways beyond our imagining, create in us the desire to grow closer to you, to walk more closely with you, to do whatever it takes, to, to bring all eagerness and diligence to bear on this issue of spiritual growth. And then God, help us one step at a time to supplement our faith with these virtues, to choreograph all of them together so that all of the results that the Bible promises, that we would experience them. We want that in our own lives, because we also want that so that we can put your transformative work on display to the world around us, so that people could look at our very lives and see how good and powerful and loving you are because you've so changed us. Wherever we are, you don't want us there. And thank you for giving us everything we need to get us where you want us to go. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you took some time to worship with us today. Uh, remember to connect with us by using the form at broadwaycc.org slash watch. You can also check out more videos on our YouTube page, including weekly videos specifically for early childhood and elementary aged kids. Have a great week.